I'm very pleased uh, to be here this morning. I'm stepping in uh, for Ali Renison, who was not able to do it. My name is uh, Jana Dreyer. I'm the founder and editor of a website that's called Borderlex, uh, covering news on trade news on trade policy of the EU, and increasingly Britain, uh, to the extent it has a trade policy. But uh, oh, we're going to get there. Um, so it's a great honor to have um, three distinguished. Uh, speakers to discuss uh, the transition issue. When I was invited to this event, I was very surprised that the panel on transition was at the beginning of the conference and not the end, which to me would have been more logical. <laughs> but uh, I think um, that's, that's the way things are and, and transition is very much in focus politically at the moment and given the time constraints set by the Article 50 uh, negotiation. Um, so let, let's just continue, you know, from the first session. I think the, the transition period was um, uh, was already discussed. So we have with us um, Ian Begg, who's at the fac uh, on the faculty of the London School of Economics and also with the UK in a changing Europe. We have Henry New Newman, who's the director of the think tank Open Europe. And we have John Springford, who is uh, head of research at the Centre for European Reform. They will all have a specific angle and take on this uh, very complex issue of a uh, transition period. Um, before we start, the, the key points we will want to discuss today is uh, what a transition period post-Brexit, what for? Uh, can it really avoid a cliff edge um, exit of the EU or does it only postpone it? Are we really talking about transition or implementation? I mean, echoing what was said already this morning. Are the EU and Britain actually sharing the same view on the transition? Um, should and can everything remain the same during the transition? Uh, and is a transition agreement a backdoor to re-entering the EU? Um, so these are the kind of discussions we'll have. Let's shoot off here on my right. Five minutes, everyone. Then a few little discussion and then I'll open the floor. I think it should be a very interactive session. Ian, to you. All right, th thank you, Lana. I, um, I'm very pleased to try to shed some light on this. I don't think there's all that much light to be shed, so you have to bear with me. <laughs> I checked in the, in the diary. I wonder if anyone else has noticed this, that the 29th of March 2019 is in fact a Friday. So the first full day of post-Brexit post will be April Fool's Day, <laughs> 1st of April 2019. Transition. I would, I'm going to try to talk through, and I know she's going to be ferocious on the timing, <laughs> two observations, two questions, and maybe two provocations to, to try to get the discussion going. The first observation is that transition, if you think of its meaning, is a shift from one state or one status to another status. And if you consider what we regard as normal transitions, let's say, in a, in a working lifetime, you're going to move from working life to retirement. And you know that uh, the consequence of that, unless you have the misfortune to be the victims of BHS, that you have a pension to look forward to. You know what the status is where you start work, and you know what the status is going to be when you reach retirement, the pensions and all the, all the associated services. But in the transition we're talking about, we do know the starting point, EU membership. We do not know the end point. So it's a transition without a, a clear uh, direction in which to go. And that is my first question, therefore, for, the, for you, which is, can we do a transition without knowing where we're going? It seems to me a, a, rather, con a rather contradiction in terms. Second... Our expectation of a transition, and I didn't hear all of the last session, so forgive me if I'm repeating anything, is that, in essence, the UK is staying in the single market for, for the duration of a transition. And what that means in practice is continuing free movement, continuing to make, possibly continuing to make payments into the, into the EU budget and so on. There may be some doubts about whether, after the formal date of Brexit, we still have much influence on rule setting, and that, that, that has surfaced as one of the issues. I tend to discount that because the number of rules that's going to be set during a transition period is not going to be that great. The, the pace of single market evolution is, is never been, 
as frenetic as some might assume from that, that assumption. But what it does imply, and this is less clear, is remaining in the European economic area as the, the kind of status. But that means being outside the customs union. Norway, Switzerland, Liechtenstein are not in the customs union formally. They are in the single market. And this could, in turn, create further problems for the, the Irish question. How do you deal with this if you have to impose some kind of border? That's, that's one of the open questions. Therefore, my second question is, given that the UK is not in EFTA, and the European Economic Area is an agreement between Party 1, the European Union, of which the UK is one signatory, and Parties 2, 3, and 4, the, the three EFTA members, would it be necessary for the UK to accede first to EFTA before it could become part of an EEA and therefore have the single market transitions? Now, my, to my two provocations, so as not to abuse my time. That's fine. First, <laughs> I fear in private eye language that we're ignoring my learned friends. What is the legal basis going to be for this? Because it's far from obvious. One possibility, and I gather, since I'm not a lawyer, I have to take this second hand, I gather that the only legally watertight way of doing this would be to prolong Article 50. And if we prolong Article 50, then leaving the European Union will not occur on the 29th of March 2019. That is a provocation in many directions, not least to those Brexiteers who think, why the hell can't we get on with it? My second provocation is to say that we just don't think in this country enough of the incentives, let alone the negotiating strategies, the incentives facing the other side. Why would they want a transition? What form of transition are they going to tolerate? And until we can start to reflect on that kind of question, we're going to be arguing about this in something of a vacuum. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that, was, that really set the scene uh, very, very usefully. To you, Henry. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think the, the, tr the fact that the UK is now pursuing the goal of having a transition of around two years is the single most important development in the government's Brexit policy uh, since the Lancaster House speech. I think I could myself have imagined um, us leaving the European Union potentially without a transition, but I think now uh, it seems, it seems almost inevitable. I think the strictures, of the strictures of the Article 50 process are obviously very tight, uh, and Whitehall didn't make the preparations that it would have needed to have done during a referendum, during the purda of the referendum campaign uh, for both possible electoral scenarios. So that's all a, a hypothetical. So I think given that the transition, a, a some sort of transition seems very likely, and particularly uh, in the hung parliament scenario, the prime minister is obviously minded to give something to those within Parliament and within her party who are concerned about the disruptions of Brexit, what sort of transition could we have? Well, we could, we could either come up with a bespoke transition, which we spend a huge amount of time and political capital negotiating with Europe, and I think that would be obviously something to avoid, or we could seek to uh, uh, stay in or, um, or and rejoin the, the EEA for a time-limited period, but I think that um, actually doesn't solve that many of the problems um, and has been deemed as sort of politically unacceptable by uh, many on the sort of Eurosceptic right of the Tory party who want to ensure that, um, in my language rather than theirs, there are sort of facts on the ground that irrevocably pull the UK out of the EU by the end of the Article 50 process. So that really leaves us with a, um, what is a uh, sort of Lampedusan situation where everything changes but everything stays the same. So we'll technically leave the EU at the end of Article 50 but voluntarily keep everything in place. Um, and I, so I, I, I'm not sure I find it incorrect, but I don't think that means that we'll be in the EEA uh, as a sort of a technically. I suspect that we'll have a international legal agreement, uh, which will also be put into domestic law with the, uh, the UK side, which will legislate for the sort of structures of the transition. Uh, so that's a sort of what sort of transition. Will the EU accept the transition? Uh, I think I think so. I think as long as the UK accepts the um, that the, they can't mess around with the that we can't mess around with the four freedoms during that period, and the the acquis essentially ap applies, which is Theresa May's major concession uh, in the Florence speech, where she said it would be within the existing rules and regulation of the EU. I don't see there being a problem, and of course this plays in the EU's favour because although the UK clearly isn't prepared to leave, uh, the EU isn't prepared for the UK side leaving either, uh, and also there's the crucial question of uh, cash and the A transition finesses a lot of the problems that the EU would otherwise have with a substantial hole in their multi-annual financial framework. 
Um, and on the, the sort of narrow question of customs, which Ian touched on, if I can uh, make my phone work, I'll be able to pull up the... Uh, Barnier recently was asked uh, about the um, transition and said to German paper Handelsblatt, a short time, for a short time after the UK's former exit from the EU, he could imagine a situation where the economic status quo would continue to apply, which besides the internal market also includes the customs union. So I think it's possible to imagine a scenario like that working for, for a time-limited period. So my, my guess is that we, the transition will be shorter than two years and will run till uh, the end of December 2020. The question is what the UK will seek to carve out from that transition, and that I think is where we might get into more difficult grounds. So we've heard, uh, uh, I interviewed the Environment Secretary at Conservative Conference, and he certainly wasn't clear as to whether he was imagining the common fisheries policy and the common uh, agricultural policy being applied during the transition period. I think that'll be difficult to negotiate. Equally, the question of what happens with new rules. If Boris Johnson's red lines were accurate in the, his Sun interview published before conference, he suggested he wouldn't be happy with the, the UK taking new rules during the transition. Well, that's quite hard to see how that would work. And finally, on immigration, the Prime Minister is reportedly very keen to uh, register new arrivals of EU nationals during the transition period, but also to deport more nationals. And I think that could be an area where uh, obviously she gets into some problems. Does the transition solve everything? No, I don't think it does at all. I think it's, um, it's, it will remain very, uh, it'll remain complex and difficult. And of course, part of the, part of the uh, most important reasons for having a transition is the surety that it should provide business and individuals as we leave the European Union. And of course, by the nature of everything, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed negotiations, we won't actually know that for certain that we've got a transition until the, uh, almost the end of the Article 50 process. So that's a particular difficulty. Having said that, I think once the, the Council is now, sorry, the Commission is now working on internal policy ideas on transition, once those are, um, are formalized and published, I think we, we on the UK side will be able to see the Commission's opening offer. And I think that gives us quite a clear idea of whether that is deliverable. And I think, as I said, given that the Prime Minister has accepted the overarching, um, this overarching concession that it will be within the EU's rules and regulations, I can, I'm quite optimistic about it. Final point. Uh, at a reception at the Conservative Conference, the Prime Minister said that she expects that we will know the shape of our future relationship when we enter the transition. Now, that's, that's certainly possible, and I think it's, it's the right goal, but I'm not certain that it's correct. Um, I, I think it's quite possible, actually, that the, tra the transition period ends up being an extension, really, of, uh, of the negotiation timetable. Um, and uh, therefore, I, I've never bought the argument that you can't, transition, you can't have a transition period without knowing to where you're transitioning, because um, if a transition period maintains the status quo, then essentially, uh, I think that, that, that argument falls away. I think if you're, if you're having a transition period which shifts into a new thing, uh, then that's, that's, uh, that's different, but I accept that it's a point of disagreement perhaps with Ian. Uh, yeah, so there's uh, some reflections and uh, I look forward to discussing it further. So it's getting more and more complicated. Uh, John, to you. Thanks very much, Jana, uh, and thank you, Henry and Ian. Um, it's always difficult going last because a lot of things have been said. Um, I suppose what, I, what I'd like to do is just um, take issue a bit with what Theo Rycroft said yesterday, unfairly, uh, sorry, earlier, unfairly, because he's left the room, um, and just also focus a bit on what Henry said at the end, because I think it's really important. Um, and, and Theo said, um, you know, I'm not going to pass the difference between the PM's vision of what the transition is um, and what the 27's vision is, talking about the framework versus the prolongation of the acquis. Um, but I think it's pretty important to do so, um, so I'll, I'll do that now. Um, the Prime Minister's stated position remains what it was really since the beginning, which is that the future relationship can be negotiated in some detail before Britain leaves in 2019, um, that the transition period is an implementation period of that agreement, um, that the future agreement will be put in place during that period. Um, so what does that mean practically? It means you have to have a fairly detailed agreement uh, on what the final relationship will be before you enter the transition. Um, it means that uh, the final deal will be translated during that implementation phase. High-level negotiations on um, the future relationship will largely be over and you'll be moving into implementation negotiations with lower-level officials doing it. Um, some sectors of the economy shift um, into the new relationship with the EU earlier than others. Rycroft mentioned um, the European Court of Justice and Henry mentioned common agricultural policy, common fisheries policy and so forth. Um, and um, really that summary deal needs some kind of legal or strong political force um, 
you know, perhaps written into the Article 50 agreement, that's going to be very difficult. Perhaps, you know, a sort of really quite detailed political declaration about what that future relationship is. Um, otherwise, you're not implementing, you're still negotiating. Um, why does May want this? Well, because, um, you know, there's the fear that, that Brexiters will say, look, we're getting stuck in an off-the-shelf transition. Um, we might stay in the EU. You, you know, it's going to go on for ages. Um, you know, they also just don't want off the shelf because it means a prolongation of the EU's law past the date of Brexit. Um, and so there's a battle going on in Cabinet, as we know. Um, Hammond said in July that um, he wants a transition that preserves the single market and the customs union. Um, uh, so he wants it to be off the shelf. Um, and that the free movement of people and the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice continues. Um, I happen to think that Hammond's vision, and I think Henry, is, Henry sort of hinted at this too, I think Hammond's vision is much more likely than May's one, but I think it's still, still quite difficult, and more difficult maybe than um, has been suggested so far. The first reason is that the EU is going to be pretty tough on the trade issue. Um, Theresa May's ruled out uh, the EEA um, and Canada. Um, she wants something in between. Canada plus, plus, plus is the phrase that's used. Um, the difficulty with this is that um, the 27 want to maximise the difference between single market membership and uh, a trade deal. Um, so they're going to push for any kind of FTA to be pretty close to uh, CETA or the Korea FTA. The other issue was mentioned, um, good question earlier, um, uh, that the deals which the EU has negotiated with places like Canada and Korea have most favoured nation clauses in them over services. This means that if the EU and the UK negotiate a services deal which is far superior uh, to those deals, then Korea, uh, Canada and Japan, once that agreement um, is ratified, um, they will say, look, we've got most favoured nation clauses, you have to give us the same as what you've given to the UK. So I think that's going to be, going to be very tricky. Um, the other issue is, um, the longer that you take negotiating the future trade deal, the longer the uncertainty over whether a transition is going to happen. Um, and the more uh, that the UK pushes for something which is comprehensive and a lot further than, than Canada, um, then the longer it's going to take to get to an agreement on what the future relationship is um, and, and the transition. Um, and you know, we've heard already from uh, about the chemical sector um, that a lot of companies um, have contingency plans for the event of no deal. Um, you know, this is particularly acute in the financial sector because there are financial stability concerns if there is no deal, um, seeing as the UK is the derivatives uh, centre uh, of the European uh, financial market. Um, so if we have the talks dragging on about the future relationship with no guarantee of a transition past you know, the end of the first quarter of 2018, then there's going to be some disinvestment, there's going to be some movements of operations. Um, so, I mean, the, the most likely outcome, I think I agree with Henry, is that we end up with a standstill transition. Um, I think it will probably last quite a lot longer than two or three years because uh, there are, it's a, it's a huge negotiation. There's also quite a lot of physical infrastructure that will have to be built. Um, most customs experts think that the customs infrastructure um, that the UK is going to need is going to take about five years to set up. Um, and also there's, uh, you know, new systems that have to be put in place to deal with a new migration regime uh, in the UK uh, to replace free movement. Um, and, and that is also going to take some time. Um, and I think Probably, you know, speculating on the future relationship. I know people are going to be talking about this in later sessions, but um, I, I think, given the red lines on both sides, we're more likely to end up with um, a, an FTA that looks more like Canada than it does uh, uh, than it does the European Economic Area. Thanks. Good. All right. So, uh, yeah. I mean, it, transition is meant. Is, was intended to simplify things. It doesn't look like it. <laughs> so um, maybe my, my first question is, I mean, you already mentioned it. Is this two-year transition really relevant for 
individuals and businesses. I'm, I've been, I was in a conference recently with many business representatives saying, listen, in a way, it's not really relevant. On one hand, we need the certainty that there will be a transition as of March next year, because we're making our hiring, sourcing, uh, buy, cross-border buying decisions uh, a year ahead. So uh, we need to know. On the other hand, if you, you need to know how long, you need to know what the next relationship will be if you're going to invest in new capacity, new IT systems and that kind of stuff. And then the horizon for that is three to five years. Uh, also, many of the big multinationals have already already started taking decisions on location, not location, hiring, not hiring. So are we having a completely irrelevant discussion here? No. No. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I wanted to be provocative, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> the whole point of a transition is to <clears throat> ease in the, the sudden break in membership of the e mm. EU to some new status. Mm. I think just about everybody's agreed that the trade deal will not be negotiated by a year from today, by, which is when we really need to have it in place if we wanted to ratify. And if you don't have some form of transition, but I, I've, I fail to understand how you can say a business is not concerned about the uncertainty in, in, involved. Um, you know, I've, sp I've spoken to several foreign investors. They are, yeah. <clears throat> big Japanese companies, for instance, who say, well, we don't first we don't understand what's going on. And if we did, we need to start making decisions now about these things. About the financial services is exactly the same. You need, you need regulatory approval, you need, you need premises, you, you need IT systems, and you need to recruit staff. If you, if you don't have a transitional period, all that is going to be a car crash. I think, I think the, the one point in, potentially to pick up from what you're saying is that there is, of course, given that you can't agree a transition until the end of the Article 50 process, mm -hmm. you can't firmly agree it, businesses will have to plan for essentially a, a for, for both possibilities to a degree. And the question is how, how far they go to, towards the latter thing. I mean, I, think I take, slightly take issue with your point about the point of a transition being to simplify things. I, mean, it's just, I think this is obviously a very complex question of how we untie uh, four and a half decades of membership. I think the point of the transition is to, to smooth that rather than uh, essentially to, rather than really just simplify it. I just wanted to also go back to something that John was saying about the Canada deal, um, which I think, I know this will be discussed in, uh, later, but I think that is where the battle, of, battle within the cabinet and government and uh, really the, the, qu the question the country needs to, to answer is. I don't think there's a disagreement over, uh, over the transition. I think uh, my understanding is that uh, the cabinet is pretty united on the need for a, cabin, uh, for, for, a, uh, for a transition. There are sort of detailed questions or minor details within what gets carved out. But broadly, on the, uh, on the idea of a transition that keeps things the same, I think there's pretty widespread agreement. And of course, uh, the CETA deal is the, the deepest deal that the EU has done, but it's not the deepest deal that the EU wanted to do. The EU wanted to go further, uh, particularly on financial services, and it was Canada that was concerned um, to not open up its services further. So I, I, mean, I think uh, the EU, you may well be right that the, um, that the, the trade deal will be particularly difficult to negotiate, um, perhaps. But ultimately, if, Canada, if the EU is willing to offer Canada much more than that, and Canada obviously an economy much further away and much less integrated than ours, it would be, I think, people across Europe will be asking why, why the EU wouldn't offer that to the UK. Uh, yeah, so a few thoughts there. Uh, thanks. I mean, maybe I'll just come back on, on Henry's point, if, if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, so on the question of Canada and financial services, I mean, one reason why financial ser the, the EU wanted to go further was because the EU has a big international financial centre then when it was being negotiated, whereas it wouldn't <laughs> after Britain has left. Um, and, and the other thing that's going on is that, um, uh, you know, there's lots of talk in the Commission about tightening up equivalents uh, regulation so that it actually becomes harder, not easier, um, for financial centres outside the European Union to um, provide cross-border financial services. And obviously that's partly in respect to Brexit. Um, but it's not entirely punitive. I mean, there are big questions about um, if you have such a large financial centre that has the ability to cause financial instability in your jurisdiction, then any sensible government will want to have some degree of regulatory and supervisory control over, the, over those institutions. Um, and 
if the UK is not going to accept that, we don't know, but, but if the UK is not going to accept that, then it's going to be very difficult to negotiate something uh, more comprehensive that covers services. May, may I come back to that question then and also open to the floor? I mean, uh, transition. Is this a backdoor to remain in the EU or not? What is your bet? Because it seems to be that more radical Brexit proponents here in the UK so, seem to be smelling a rat and not liking it. Is that your view too? No, I don't think it's a, in any sense a back door. If, yeah. if for some reason Brexit is going to be interrupted or reversed, it isn't going to be because there's a transition in place. And nobody seems to be talking about a transition of longer than two or three years. Maybe it could extend slightly beyond that, but it, it is quite clearly a transition. If a move takes wing to try to reverse Brexit, it won't be on the back of that. Okay. I would also say um, no. I think that was, there was, a, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that there was a strong concern from some Eurosceptics that staying in the EEA would be a sort of um, a position, potential launching pad for re-entry or stopping exit. I think that was mistaken, but that was their, that was their concern. Mm -hmm. um, my tests of the transition are uh, twofold. One, that it is um, transitional, i.e. brief, um, and two, that it takes us out of the EU. And I think as long as it fulfills those two commitments, uh, conditions, I don't think there'll be that much problem. I think in terms of future re-entry, obviously any future government at any point could apply for re-entry to the European Union. That's the nature of our uh, constitutional setup. Um, but I don't see it happening particularly soon. One of the things I should have said before, though, is I think that what this panel illustrates is the extent of, um, the extent of confusion around what the Prime Minister has actually proposed on the transition. Um, and that's potentially fair enough, and of course the, negotiating is, the negotiations are ongoing and the government may not want to say everything in private. So if, that it's, if it's the same thing in public that it says in private, but it will come a time quite soon where they need to publish a, a position paper about what they understand the transition to entail. Um, and I think the, the fact that the UK has been very slow in publishing those papers overall has of course complicated the uh, negotiation process because the EU is very good at producing uh, long and complex uh, technical papers, and the UK has found that much harder. Okay. Ian wanted to say something very shortly, and then... Yeah, so yeah. Th this notion that we can reapply if, if the wind changes is, to me, rather far-fetched, because Article 49, which is the reapplication procedure, would almost certainly exclude a British rebate and a British exemption from Schengen and the euro. Sure, I mean, I don't think... I wouldn't be have, I'm not advocating reapplying uh, in the future, but I just no, think any, e any... Even were it to arise it would be on much worse terms than we currently have. Quite, uh, the way, which is why I think it's unlikely. But I, my point is just that any future government can make any decision it likes. That's the nature of our constitution. Yeah. John? Uh, I mean, just very briefly, um, I, I'm just very sceptical that this is going to last two or three years. And I, I certainly don't think the intention is to um, try and create a kind of holding pen so that Britain can rejoin. But I do think it's going to last a lot longer than two or three years because, I mean, this is absolutely enormous negotiation. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said about infrastructure and so forth, but also it's taken us seven months to deal with three issues in the divorce. Um, and when you, uh, yeah, or not. Um, and when you're, when you're multiplying that by um, 100, then it's going to take a very long time. Um, and so that means that the transition... Well, well, both sides, for political reasons, want to say it's going to be two or three years. The UK, because uh, um, Theresa May wants to get this done before the next election. Uh, the EU, because um, it essentially gives them a bit of bargaining power to have deadlines. Um, uh, because it concentrates minds, because the economic costs of no deal are concentrated uh, in the UK um, compared to the EU. Um, but it's going to take longer, um, and that means that my bet, uh, I, I'm only occasionally a betting man, but I will be putting a bet on if it's possible that the transition will last beyond the next general election, um, in which case uh, we may have a Labour government and politics might change. Good. <laughs> Can I come back to that very briefly? I think one of the things that's actually quite interesting is uh, we've... It's, it's important not to assume that the transition is a single thing necessarily, um, and it's possible that uh, we, again, we don't know that the UK exits from different elements of that diff over different times. So is it possible that we leave um, a, a customs arrangement before we leave other arrangements? I don't know. And again, is, is it possible that we maintain the status quo on fishing for a year or two and then 
other, other elements for longer or shorter. Again, one of the areas of, of confusion in all this. Which adds up to proliferation of negotiations at a time when we're already ho hopelessly overstretched in negotiations. And more time needed, obviously. Because uh, when you just look at fisheries, <laughs> it's going to be interesting, an interesting negotiation. I suggest we open the floor. I think we had a good uh, uh, discussion uh, starting here. Let, let's, let's open it up. Uh, we'll take three questions at a time. Uh, please introduce yourself and please stick to questions um, and not too long comments, please. Thank you. Anastasia. Mm. Hello. Um, thank you very much for your, um, yes, for your, for your comments which illustrate just how much confusion there is about a transition period. Uh, one of the areas on which uh, there is confusion for me personally is how to um, really coincide and how to, how to deal with the fact that, as Henry mentioned, uh, transition can only be uh, formally agreed at the end of the Article 50 negotiations, once the full ratification process has started. Yet, as John uh, very correctly pointed out, from a business perspective, uh, it's critical to have certainty that a transition will occur uh, in Q1 of 2018 at the latest. Uh, and certainly from our perspective, a transition is critical and we've been calling for it uh, quite actively. So how is it possible to provide assurances while still respecting this formal negotiation process? Okay. Thank you, Sheila Page. I'd like to question whether it, it is actually feasible to have a transition in stages. I mean, giving us five years to adjust, to give uh, the government time to set up the car parks in Kent, it, it, and even more important, get the customs computers working, seems sensible. But given that the CU and the CAP and the fisheries policy are all intimately bound up together, and you need to have a common agricultural policy if you're going to have a customs union and vice versa, and you need someone to enforce all of this, which you might want to call a court, and you need people to be able to move and to know that they will still be able to move a, a year or two later and move back. I don't see how you can have anything but a hard change at some point. I mean, is, this, is a partial transition actually feasible, even if, I mean, Ian's right, it would require huge amounts of negotiation if it were, but I don't see how it is feasible. And the second point is the, the legal one, which a couple of us tried to raise in the last session, let us assume that we have a can opener and all 28 of us agree on all of this without any objections. There are still other countries in the world and if this is a new treaty, they will have a voice in it. If it's not a new treaty, what guarantee will they have that they can ship through Rotterdam to the UK or vice versa? And uh, how are we going to legalize whatever it is we agree? Okay, more difficult questions, gentlemen next to uh, So, so uh, John, uh, you commented that the transitional deal could potentially be five years. Uh, I have a question on that. That may be kind of the ideal pace that you may, t may want to go from an economic point of view, but uh, practically from the Conservatives' point of view, going into the next election and still being bound by various aspects of the EU, uh, I mean, I just don't see it viable. I, I think there would be a sufficient backlash that, and, and the Tories would be well aware of it, that, that they, they wouldn't go with that plan. So just your comment, please. On that. Who wants to start right, the first round? Shall I, shall I start? Yeah. Um, okay, um, on the two to three years, I mean, I mean, I agree that, you know, this would be very, very difficult for um, the Conservative Party and, and, and May to accept. Um, I mean, the, the difficulty, though, is that, um, as we've seen through the Article 50 process as well, um, that you have a, a differentiated negotiating power in this negotiation. Um, and if we think about what the 27's interests are, um, you know, a, a standstill transition is pretty good for them. Uh, it means that they don't have to make any changes. They don't have to build customs infrastructure in Calais and Rotterdam. Um, the UK is taken out of uh, the institutions and doesn't have a boat, um, so they don't have to worry about that. 
Um, and uh, the longer that it drags on, um, the, the longer the, the uncertainty, being brutal about this, um, the more likely that there is to be disinvestment from the UK uh, and investment in the EU. So the sense of urgency um, is different on either side. Um, it's certainly true that the 27 have been saying that we want this to be short and time limited because we don't really want the UK to get stuck in this transition. Um, but they also say that because of uh, the benefits of deadlines, as, they, uh, as I said earlier. So, so it may be very difficult for the Conservatives, but we are talking about an enormous negotiation. And whatever the political imperatives to say it's going to be short, I find that very <coughs> unlikely. Um, and then in the sense of it being feasible to have different phases, I mean, that, that to me seems to be a similar point that... Um, you know, the, the 27 have made pretty clear that the, in their mandate that, uh, the, that all of the acquis and all of the institutions must continue to be enforced during the transition. So it may be that the UK would like uh, to be able to get rid of the common fisheries policy or um, the European Court of Justice at an earlier stage than the end, but I don't think it's going to happen. And the political, the underlying political reason for that is um, the point that Henry made earlier about nothing being agreed until everything is agreed. Um, and, um, you know, the incentives for the 27 is to make this one big mega deal, um, which is agreed at the end of the transition process and ratified then. Then you end up with a, with a bit of a cliff edge as you move to the new, new relationship. Hopefully it's signaled in advance that that's where we're going to go to. Um, and obviously that deal will have to be ratified, which will take time. But, but I, I, can't, I can't really see it a scenario where the UK gets to essentially pick the bits that it wants to leave before the end of that period. Henry, do you want to comment on Yeah, I mean, I think on the, on the kind of surety for business point, I mean, that, that it, the process is the process, um, and I don't think there's, there's that much the government can do otherwise, other than to continue to negotiate in good faith and be clear about what it wants, and as soon as we know uh, the Commission's view, um, which, and that, as soon as that's agreed by the, uh, by the Council on what they're happy for the transition period to look like, I think that provides, as I said, some degree of assurance because we'll be able to see that's their opening offer and we can understand the difference between the UK's offer and the EU's offer. And I think it's very likely it'll be somewhere between the two of those. Um, I think the possibility of ex extending the transition beyond uh, two years, I think it's completely implausible personally. Um, I, think it's, uh, I think the Prime Minister would fall if she tried to do that. Um, and her cabinet members have made that quite clear. Um, and I think it'd be politically very difficult. I think also the EU doesn't want the UK, as, as, as John was saying, in um, f for, longer than, uh, for longer than two years. In fact, Barnier used the end of 2020 uh, date recently. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that wasn't accidental. And overall on complexity, I think, yes, this is all enormously complex and it's, um, it's very interesting for, um, for my think tank and for, for other organizations uh, here, um, but it's not insoluble. I do think there's, there's, a, there's a path through on this. Yes, the negotiations have, um, have got stuck for the first few months. That's partly because of the um, EU's um, un, uh, very misguided idea, idea of putting these, uh, the, the, one of the hardest issues, money, into the first basket, uh, rather than trying to deal with it at the end as you do in a normal negotiation. Um, but I do think this is, this is entirely soluble with political will. Um, and uh, yeah, the UK has, has moved, I think, in the right direction, and I think we can, um, we, we can get through this. Ian, do you have any, any comments? Yeah, well, a response to Anastasia first. Uh, we can maybe have some insight into this by thinking of Britain's secession as being negative enlargement. And in enlargement, there's very often resort to derogations from the existing status. For example, when Bulgaria and Romania joined the EU, there was every other member state imposed a derogation on free movement for seven years. So we, we might start to think in terms of negative enlargement and the possible derogations as a, a legal route. I don't think you can give assurances though, which is something you asked for, because we don't, we don't have any certainty about what's happening. On Sheila's point, uh, I, I fully agree with you, Sheila, that, that, but the, the one saving grace in this may be that if lose-lose starts to become the, the narrative on both sides, then you get the incentive to get, to get on with things. And just a couple of quick remarks on the, on the political risks. The political risks are huge. Some of us in the room are old enough to remember a British Prime Minister called Harold Wilson who famously said, a week is a long time in politics. 
Who would have thought a week ago that one cabinet minister would already be gone and another teetering at the moment? The chances that Theresa May will be in power after two years of the transition to make a decision on whether or not to extend it, I think are far-fetched. She, she's kept afloat by three negatives. Negative one is they can't agree on who succeeds her. Negative two is that we don't want her going to complicate the Brexit negotiations. And negative three, if she goes now, there would be a general election which Corbyn might win. <laughs> okay. We face negotiation overload. That's the, that's the concern around this. Yeah. There was a question on relations with third countries during the transition. Anyone want to answer? I didn't, I didn't actually understand the question. It was something about all other countries have to agree things. There are other stakeholders in this, is, yeah. the, is, the, is, the, is the point. All the 30th of March. Right. We will either be in the EU and therefore with all of its existing obligations and mm -hmm. rights with respect to third countries, or we will have a, a gap and a settlement agreement among the 38 to carry on as if nothing has happened. Or we will have to sign a new formal treaty with the EU saying whatever it is going to be given. And the second has no legal force. And the third would be challenged. Yeah, well, I, th well, Sheila, I thought, thought you were also asking about deals with other parts of the world. I think there's one saving grace in this, which is that Donald Trump has promised us a trade deal within 20 minutes, and he's going to, he's going to suspend Congress to enable that to happen. Of course. <laughs> do, do you want to comment on this third thing? Well, I think on the, on the point about what sort of the nature of the actual agreement with the, with the EU um, at the point of exit, I think, I mean, surely the model for that is essentially Cameron's renegotiation, which was going to essentially be a international legal declaration both by the states of the EU um, and has, you know, it's potentially challengeable in the ECJ, but I think it's unlikely that the ECJ would challenge something that had been agreed by the entire council. Uh, and except there's complications, as you say, in uh, relations with, um, with third party FTAs currently, and that will have to be worked through. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, another, another element of complexity. Again, uh, the UK's taken a decision. It's the job of uh, officials and everybody else to try and work it way through. It's not the ECJ which challenges, it's someone who brings a, a case before the ECJ and that could be so any, in the ECJ. any of 10,000 yeah. stakeholders. It yeah. could be a, the, a region in Bulgaria that does it. Yeah. There was, I mean, it's, it's, we haven't mentioned that, but among the possible carve-outs of the transition period uh, that the UK is seeking is trade policy. I mean, to stay in the customs union, stand still, and still start negotiating uh, with third countries. Is this a realistic option? Um, I mean, I, this is one of the things which I find um, s slightly frustrating. Um, I mean, it seems pretty obvious that um, you should have a compromise whereby the UK can go and negotiate um, uh, its future trade relationships with the countries that the EU has already signed free trade agreements with. Um, and in fact, you know, this is something that is already happening, which is a violation of the common commercial policy, I guess. But, it, but it's just that this is, this is just something which has to be done. So, um, you know, the idea that the 27 should die in a ditch over that, I think, is silly. I don't, I don't think it is a violation know. myself, but I think, that there's, yeah. there's been, the UK, I think the UK side accepted for too long that it could be a violation, or at least internal um, lawyers was in government were suggesting that, whereas I think they've sort of now come to a stronger position on it. Yeah, uh, I mean, but the point being that it, that it could be challengeable, um, but we're not going to see a challenge because, you know, interests are pretty much aligned really on that. And I think that's, that's the issue, that um, where the EU does not want the UK to be doing this, um, uh, you know, for example, if the UK were negotiating a free trade agreement, a new future free trade agreement with a country that the EU was negotiating with, um, then there might be more difficulties because 
the two agreements might interact with each other in a way that the EU wouldn't like. Um, so that's, that's the politics of this, I think. Yeah, okay. And let's, let's have a new round of, of questions. I'll look beyond. There was a, a hand raised earlier. Okay, here. Please, please don't forget to introduce yourself. Uh, James Blitz, Financial Times. Um, a question, I suppose, for Henry. If you have a two-year transition, as, as, as you say will happen, um, the Conservatives risk going into the 2022 20, election against a, a backdrop of, of, of real economic uncertainty and disruption. Wouldn't it make much more sense for the Conservatives basically to say, we, we've taken the UK out of the EU in 2019, so we've cashed that in politically, so to speak, and then we have a longer transitional period of five years or more, which gives a much better chance for a good economic backdrop when you get to 2022. The public at the end of the day is not really that taken up with the niceties of you know, the negotiation on trade and so on. It makes make far more sense. And my view is that the pressure of that will start to make itself felt in the discussion inside the party. Okay. Anyone else wanting to? Should I, come, should I come back yeah. on that? Yeah. I, mean, I think the, uh, that's not my understanding in terms of the, where the country's at. Um, we do, we've done quite a lot of focus group research uh, outside of London and the southeast, southwest. And in those parts of the country, people are you know, confused by why it's taking so long. Now, uh, I, I, I think we'll all under, we understand why it's taking long, but that's, that's their view. They want, they want to get on with this. Um, if the election is uh, at the last possible moment of the, under the Fixed Term Parliament Act uh, in 2022, then... Um, Assuming we're out by out of the transition by the end of 2020, um, I don't think I think that gives quite a lot of time. And obviously, on the economics, uh, I mean, I think there's uncertainty now, but the economy is broadly uh, continuing to grow. Um, and if, if the economic situation changes very dramatically, obviously that could have an effect on the politics. But I think it's pretty hard to predict that far away. Um, so I don't see the uh, I don't see that judgment politically changing. Was it? Does someone else want to? Say something. No? <laughs> Do you want to add something? Well, on, on the politics, I think it would be deeply unfortunate if we were caught up for another four years in what suits the Conservative Party, since that's been, in many ways, the, the root of all the shenanigans we've seen over the last uh, what, five, even 35 years uh, that have led to the, the Brexit decision. No political party it can really predict what the status of it, what its fortune is going to be three months ahead, let, al let alone uh, in 2021 or when a transition might be coming to a conclusion. I therefore think we need to project this far more onto what it means for the economy, for the prospects for business and for citizens. And citizens are going to wake up and, and, and realise that things are changing and they'll want to know, can we change this rapidly enough to suit me? even take something that might appear relatively trivial, like the European health insurance card. Will you still have it during a transition? Or is that something that's going to be negotiated away? Mm -hmm. That's where we should focus, rather than, rather than whether the Conservatives gain one or two points in the opinion polls. Can I, can I just say something about, um, about the economy and how that's likely to interact with the politics of this um, over the next few years? I mean, you know, economic forecasting is a mugs game, as everyone knows, um, but I, I suppose I'd, I'll have a go There's anyway. a lot of mugs around there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll be a mug. Um, so a lot has been made about the fact that um, the UK has fallen to the de developed, developed economy, uh, the bottom of the developed economy growth league. Um, and, and it's certainly true I think it's undeniable that the slowdown that we have seen since the start of the year is related to the devaluation of sterling after the Brexit vote and potentially compounding uncertainty hitting business investment. I think, I think that there aren't many people that would disagree with that. The question is, um, does the transition lift the uncertainty to the extent that we therefore get a rise in the growth rate? Um, and the modelling, which you know, much better economic forecasts than I am, uh, have done, suggests that you know, in 2019, that the pass-through of the inflation that has come from the devaluation of sterling um, will have largely subsided, um, and that the UK will be 
uh, back to its structural rate of growth, which, by the way, has been revised down over time. The OBR is likely to do that again next week. Um, is that story plausible? I'm not sure it is. I mean, if we are looking at uh, a negotiation which is going to be much tougher than a lot of people thought about what the future relationship will be and the interaction of that with the transition. Um, and if, and I think Henry's right, that we're not going to get a huge amount of certainty really early on um, in 2018, um, then we're going to have you know, some compounding pressures of uncertainty. I mean, we don't know what, the effect, what those effects will be or how big they will be, but they will be negative. They will essentially act as a drag on the economy. So I, I'm not sure that you know, we, ha we, we get a transition in 2018, then the economy is back to its structural growth rate. I think that we're, we're going to see a much bumpier time between now and, and March 2019 than that. Can I say something on citizens? Um, because I think this is quite an interesting point. So clearly, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, I think this is an area where there is, is a, um, a problem from the UK side. So my understanding is that the Prime Minister is keen to, uh, and this is obviously some of this has been reported, the Prime Minister is keen to register newly arriving EU nationals during the transition period. Um, and there's a question about people whether freedom of movement will broadly continue during the transition period or not. We had different answers from different ministers at different times on that. So I think that's, that is obviously a very uh, complex area about biz which business is, um, is also uh, legitimately concerned. I think the Prime Minister's view, as I understand it, is that, uh, although this is not settled government policy, is that uh, citizens should, EU nationals should be allowed to continue to come for purposes of work, but not otherwise during the transition. I think that'll be very hard to negotiate with the EU side. What I can imagine them being able to negotiate is that nationals will be, for essentially freedom of movement will continue during the transition. However, those nationals who arrived between the end of the Article 50 process and the end of the transition, i.e. those nationals arriving during the transition, will not accrue the same long-term rights uh, in the same way that people who arrived before, the, um, before, the, uh, before Brexit accrue. But that, I think, is a, an area of complexity and political difficulty. There was a question in the audience here. Sarah Murray, City of London Corporation. I've also been trying to get clarity, and it'd be interesting to get the panel's views on uh, not just the legal arrangements uh, or the, of, of, of what the agreement would be, uh, but the ratification procedures for, for different options. So, uh, as I think I've probably read the same article as you, in about you know the, the only legal certainty you have about a transition is actually just an extension of the Article 50 process, but we, we assume that that's not politically feasible. So, uh, thinking about, for example, an EEA arrangement, how, uh, what kind of ratification procedures can that be, or, or could that be wrapped up in the Article 50 exit uh, agreement? Um, or indeed, if it were to be an association agreement, what, again, would the ratification um, uh, procedures be uh, amongst the member states? Because uh, obviously what we're all aiming for is simplicity. And I was, I was interested with your comment, Chair, about uh, how businesses that you'd been interacting with were saying, it doesn't really matter. All the businesses that I interact with are saying it's absolutely imperative mm. that agreement is reached, albeit that it can only be a political agreement for, for now, but that agreement is reached. Uh, within the next mm. couple of months, mm. that, that is without any, any shadow of a doubt. And if I could just ask a supplementary to Henry, because of your insights and, and engagement with, with the Cabinet, um, to explain the logic of a differentiated timing within a, 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 an adaptation or transitional period. Businesses w would say to you that that doesn't make any sense. It creates even more uncertainty if you're br bringing in, for example, new dispute resolution mechanisms. It is further uncertainty. If you could explain the political logic of that, that would be very helpful as well. Thank you. Yeah, very, very, very good uh, questions here. So uh, ratification of the transition deal. Okay, there was a second. I think we'll do... Okay, so the questioning has restarted. So we'll take... Uh, Another two questions then. Yes, mine's very quick. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm Pam Tatlow from the Association for Modern Universities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea that you can just come here to work and you can't come here to study uh, does create a number of issues for a number of sectors. Uh, but my question is this, and it's partly, I suppose, a political question. Mm -hmm. The Prime Minister has shown that she's had very fixed views about immigration in the past uh, against organizations like ourselves, but also the CBI, which doesn't even believe in a migration uh, 
Um, how far do you think we can progress these negotiations, either around Article uh, 50 or what happens after, if that fixed view of migration becomes a red line? Okay, was there another person? Okay, so we have two big issues now being, being raised. So basically ratification uh, and then uh, will, will the UK move on migration? Anyone? I go? um, on, on ratification again, as I said, I, th I think the, um, my understanding is that this, as I said, will, will look something like uh, Cameron's renegotiation, i.e. a council level agreement that will then be put into UK domestic law. Uh, there was a article in the Times earlier this week um, by Ollie Robbins, which I think was um, is very is, is accurately sourced, which suggests that the UK uh, the UK is envisaging a separate uh, bill or a separate act to uh, clarify the to put, to give legal status to the withdrawal agreement and any transition, and that's mm. separate from what they're calling the withdrawal agreement, which is really the repeal bill. Um, so. If, if that's the sort of that, that's how it'll work from the from the UK side at EU level, I think, as I said, it'll be an international legal declaration on differentiated timings. Uh, it's not my, uh, my it's not my idea. Um, it's what I think the Prime Minister said at um, at Lancaster House, and um, I haven't heard it. I hadn't heard anyone sort of take that away. She talked about phasings and different periods. So I think that is. I, mean, I accept that it could create much more complexity. Uh, one obvious area potentially is that the UK. Um, if the UK exited from the, the customs uh, union or a customs union with the EU customs union earlier than it exited other area elements, that's potentially comprehensible. But with, will the customs systems be ready before the rest of it? Probably not. Uh, on fisheries, I think fisheries is one area where you could more discreetly carve things out again, um, because obviously it doesn't apply across the whole of the uh, across the whole of the EEA. But it's just saying it's, I think the government hasn't been clear on that, and I, I also would welcome more clarity uh, on. Migration um, and students, I, sh I should have said before, I don't think she's, the premise is against people coming here to study. Um, I think, I, I also think there's a lot of confusion about the sort of arguments about taking students out of the migration numbers. Uh, obviously, I'm perfectly in favor of people coming to the UK to study, but if students, if people come here for the purposes of studying and then leave, then that has no effect on, on net migration numbers. So I think that entire argument is a slight red herring. Um, on on immigration more broadly, Open Europe is doing a project, and we've, as I said, we did a lot of focus group research, and we're doing polling, and this will be out in the next few uh, weeks, looking at the public attitudes to migration. And for whatever reason, um, well, I think all of us can understand, there is a crisis of confidence in the UK's migration system. I think it's perfectly possible to imagine that if the government is able to demonstrate that they're essentially effectively controlling migration, the public will be much more supportive of continued migration in the sort of uh, way that I would be happy to accept and businesses um, and universities would like. But I think at present, I think it'd be very difficult for any government not to address the widespread public concerns about that. Any other? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in response to Sarah, is it from the City Corp? Uh, I think what you're hinting at is something that uh, highlights the, what some academics like to call the trilemma. One is that the economic, economically desirable thing to do is to have a very smooth transition through, during which all sorts of things can happen. Politically, that creates tensions because on the one hand, Brexiteers are going to be unhappy about an extended transition, and the other side is going to be uncomfortable about something in which seems to give the Brits the benefits that, uh, that are going to be denied to other countries. But the third, third arm of the trilemma is legal. It's not at all obvious to me, and you read some of the articles, and I would commend to everybody Catherine Barnard's article in, in the UK in the Changing Europe on Article 218. You need to understand what is legally possible and what legal structures are going to have to be put in place to resolve the other two arms of the trilemma, the contest between the political and the economic. And this is not going to be as easy as, as many people assume. Now, on, on migration, I think that I was, I've always found the, the net migration target to be, to put it politely, curious. I mean, nobody targets a net. You target gross flows all the time. And, and this is a very eccentric way of doing things. But that leads me on to a, a further reflection, which is, although this event is about Brexit and trade, 
the, the post-Brexit deal is going to encompass far more than trade. It's going to encompass the, the investment regime. And we know how complicated that was, both in the Canada deal and in, in discussing TTIP with investor-to-state dispute settlement procedures, which I don't pretend to fully to understand. There's going to be a security dimension to the future deal. There are going to be areas where Britain will want to remain involved in EU programs, such as for research. And all these things add to the complexity of the negotiation. And if I may, just a quick word on the economy. We are in danger of being seduced into thinking what's happening to the economy is predominantly or even exclusively Brexit-related. It's not. The, the underlying difficulty this economy faces is productivity, which has not changed in the last decade. The productivity level of the British economy today is exactly what it was in 2008. It's similar and in other European countries. So it's similar in other no, it's not similar, because other countries have grown. Brit Britain's productivity has been stagnant. It's true that other countries have seen a slowdown, but that's, that's different, because a slowdown is not the same as an absence of growth. Okay. But the productivity and in London is similar to, and the southeast is similar to France. It's a, it's a national productivity yeah, it's problem. It's a level, and not yeah. the growth yeah. of productivity. Mm -hmm. And there's a very, very straightforward proposition that economic growth is the product of the number of people in employment and the productivity level they, they achieve. If productivity is stagnant, and if we're taking people out of the economy because we're deterring or trying to push them out through emigration, the British economy risks having a GDP headline figure of zero. Now, you may say that's good or bad because we should really be looking at per capita, but a GDP level of zero is politically dynamite. Um, can I just, yeah, I, I mean, just on that issue, I mean, it, it, that's, that's obvious that um, the UK's productivity growth has been absolutely dismal and that preceded both um, the uncertainty that came before the referendum, the decision by the referendum, and then the, um, the impact of sterling, um, which is essentially about consumer power, consumer buying power, purchasing power. It's not really about productivity. Um, but our best thinking about the impact of Brexit on productivity is that it will make it worse um, because uh, we know that membership of the single market has led to big increases in the amount of trade done between the UK and the EU27. Um, the fact that they are a natural rep a trading partner um, because they're so close by and because they're rich economies, rich economies trade a lot with each other, um, means that if we raise barriers with the 27, that's more costly than raising barriers with countries which are further away. Um, and the impact of raising those barriers will be um, a trajectory towards um, you know, a, a, a lower productivity level um, because, uh, or a lower productivity level than would otherwise have been the case because um, you know, trade essentially uh, leads to a higher productivity by comparative advantage effect. So Brexit is going to make the UK's main economic problem worse. It might not make it loads worse, but it is going to make it worse. Um, and just on, on the migration issue, um, I think the question, the question was, um, you know, given, given the apparent politics of migration in the UK, um, what does that mean for the negotiation of the final deal with the EU? Is, is that kind of, what does it mean for the negotiations? I mean, I think I've been grappling a bit with this question myself. What does, if the UK offered something which was halfway between its pretty tough migration regime with countries outside Europe and free movement, would that buy it anything in the other areas? I mean, that, that is a, a big question. My suspicion is that it wouldn't buy that much. I mean, mm. the interesting thing about what's happened in Switzerland is um, after they had a referendum whereby they said we want essentially to 
cap the number of EU nationals that come in. Um, we've ended up with the Swiss essentially backing down. There's been some very mild derogations from free movement rules or exemptions, but nothing huge. Um, but if, as you say, Theresa May's view is that we need to get migration significantly down from the EU, then I don't think it's going to buy us very much and it makes a, a, a trade agreement much more likely than, you know, a, a CETA style trade agreement much more likely than the Canada plus, 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 which they're talking about. And even an agreement at all. I mean, mm. it depends how this is handled politically. I would, mm. domestically, I mean, if we hear more of these stories about home letter offices, uh, home, home office letters, it's not going to help. Anyway, there was another question. We still have a few. Yeah, 10 more minutes, so. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, my name is Richard Miles. I'm from Absolute Strategy Research. Um, so, say your name again, we didn't uh, hear you. Richard Miles from Absolute Strategy Research. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just wonder whether we're being slightly optimistic about the chances of a transitional deal. It seems to be sort of the received wisdom that this is by far the most likely, the likely out, most likely outcome. Um, I, I think I just had maybe one more specific question about um, about the chances of it. So people like Manfred Weber in the European Parliament is saying that it was very problematic for them, the idea that um, a country which is outside the European Union could have the same kind of conditions as one that's inside the EU, which sort of suggests, and I don't know whether that just means, you know, you lose your judges, you lose your seat on the council, you lose your MEPs. Is that enough for them? Or does it need to be sort of, you know, even, even worse than that? And I think my second question would be, um, is it... Is it really in the sort of political imperative to um, demonstrate the costs of leaving and obviously also the benefits of membership if you provide this sort of smooth glide path um, to a future relationship? Um, and I think, and, and you know, if I may, just one more third question actually. Um, <laughs> if the UK, um, if it is very clear that the UK does want to restrict immigration um, from the EU and doesn't want to sort of give uh, particularly sort of um, advantageous conditions to the EU27 post Brexit. How does that impact whether the EU would be likely um, to um, to offer them a transitional uh, deal? Okay, three questions in one. Is there? Okay, we had three questions, <laughs> but uh, let's let's tackle them. I think very very important questions that were raised here. Well, maybe one first remark to make, it's neglected in this, is that although the EU has been negotiating as 27 with the mandate to Barnier, when it comes to the, the, the precise detail of a transition arrangement, the EU will be 27 or even more than 27 because there are so many interests that have to be squared in this. Manfred Weber represents the EPP, the European People's Party, the centre-right blocking, which itself has been unhappy with David Cameron's decision to take them out of it is one of the reasons that Angela Merkel has been less fulsome in her support of, of what uh, the Conservatives might have hoped to hear from her. First, therefore, we have to take account of the different views. I don't think it torpedoes a transition if transition is seen as the way of smoothing the way towards a new settlement in the future for the simple reason that I put before, which is if you get it wrong, both sides lose. And when both sides lose, they can see the incentives to, to, to arrange something in a relatively smooth manner. But I do come back to the trilemma I mentioned earlier, that you, you have what's economically desirable as opposed to what's politically feasible and legally enforceable. And that, that navigating between these three poles is going to be the, the nub of getting a, an effective transition. Any... Yeah, I, mean, I think the, um, on the European Parliament, obviously, they will have a role. They will be trying to seek some degree of concessions, but it's a relatively limited role. Uh, and it obviously, um, the, the, key, the key actors here will be the, uh, the Commission and the 27. Um, and I also think there's much less unity amongst the uh, 27 about the next stages of, the, um, of, of Brexit than there are now. Uh, something I've been very struck by every time I meet any minister or official from, uh, from the countries. Um, on the sort of on the Home Office letters point, I mean, I think this is this is unfortunately an example of um, there are many legitimate criticisms can be made about Home Office uh, bureaucracy. Uh, my other half received a letter asking him to uh, 
to, to, to sort of guarantee that somebody was who this photo uh, identified them as being for a passport application and said, please return to, um, please return to me, uh, with neither a name on the letter or an address to return it to. So it's kind of, you know, I mean, uh, uh, the Home Office is perfectly capable of making many mistakes. However, I think the, 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 there's a perfectly legitimate um, it's perfectly legitimate for the UK to seek to deport people who are here illegally. Um, and I think that that's part of this broader crisis of public confidence in our migration system overall. And that's something I think that is, uh, that is driving a political concern that uh, may be pushing policies in directions that we may, not, may all not like. Uh, and certainly when we've done, the polling that we've done in terms of looking at a migration cap finds that the public think it's uh, not a perfect policy by any stretch, but equally support it because they think that without a cap, even if the cap is essentially ineffectual, uh, without it, they'd be, they'd be, they would choose a hard policy over no policy. Um, and that, I think, is the, the challenge for policymakers is to come up with something that enjoys public confidence. Yeah. Okay. J John, um, no, want to say something in my ad? I mean, are you so... Do you agree with Henry on the power of the European Parliament in the Article 50 package? Yeah, yeah, but, uh, yeah, okay. yeah I, I mean, um, I, I'm not an institutions guy, but I, I, I think I do agree with Henry, really, um, and, and actually with Ian, that um, if there's going to be a transition, well, I think it's going to be a standstill transition, but if there's going to be a transition, that the European Parliament won't wreck it, because mm. um, one, they would then be imposing costs on countries, particularly those which do a lot of trade with the UK, Ireland, Netherlands, Germany. Um, two, they would be doing it um, against the wishes of the council, um, which I, I don't find hugely plausible. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think, I think there, might be, there might be more difficulty with the European Parliament about the final relationship. Um, you know, they've inserted themselves quite strongly into trade negotiations. Mm -hmm. um, and ISDS, which we mentioned earlier, has been a particular bugbear. So that, that, that might be tricky, but with the transition, I'm not so sure. Um, on the transition versus migration, I, I also am maybe a bit more optimistic. Um, I think the 27 have accepted that free movement is going to end. Um, but what they don't want is for the free movement to end in a transition where the UK has other rights. Um, I mean, it should really be seen as a right free movement, but for the UK, it's seen as an obligation for some reason. Um, but, but, that's the, but that's the way it is. So I think if the UK agrees to a standstill, then I don't think the migration issue is such a huge problem. Um, but in the long term, in the long term relationship, I'm, I'm also a bit skeptical that it, that it, that it matters a, as much as a lot of people think, unless um, the UK were willing to do something like Switzerland, where you have very, very cosmetic changes to freedom of movement, then that might buy you something. But if we are talking about um, you know, a, a sort of mildly pro-EU, uh, where we discriminate in favor of EU citizens vis-a-vis -vis those from the rest of the world, then I don't think it's gonna buy, it's gonna buy that much. Because the EU wants to, there to be a big distance between single market and FTA. Um, the UK wants there to be a sort of narrow distance. But I, I, I think the EU view will, will win out. Okay, we have three more minutes, so if someone really wants to place a very last question, now is the moment. Yeah, um, and, then, and then we're going to wrap up for lunch. Is it at all possible or feasible that Brexit will not happen? <laughs> Facing all, those, well, a good all, the, all the conversations <laughs> we're, we're hearing for the last hour, yeah. will they be like, no, we, we don't want this? <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd be a bit less definitive, probably not. The only way I can see it happening is if, uh, I mean, this is where, you know, the, the hardline Brexiters have some, some reason to be a bit nervous. I mean, if the, if the transition lasts past the election, we have uh, the Labour Party win that election, public opinion changes, the economy has doing, been doing poorly, um, you know, perhaps the 27 say, um, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll let you in on fairly similar terms then possibly, but there are big reasons why a lot of that stuff isn't going to happen. Ian. Well, my, my answer to, would also be no, but for a different reason, which is that you need to imagine a political pathway that would enable it to happen. If we accept that uh, Article 50 is going to end in barely 18 months, 
time, less than 18 months' time now, can you see circumstances in which there will be a parliamentary majority to hold a second referendum, because that's what you need, and you need a, a parliamentary majority to pass the act that would enable that to happen. I can't see it, because the, both main political parties have said they accept Brexit. The short time period is the, the, the main reason that, that this is politically not feasible. Can, can I conclude with a lighter note, going back to the question earlier? Re readers of the Asterix books will know that they have very imaginative names for the characters, including the dog, who in French is known as idée fixe, fixed ideas. <laughs> Translated into English is even better. He's called dogmatics. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I suggest we, we wrap up this session. Um, I mean, it was a very rich conversation. I'm not going to sum it up. Uh, but my personal conclusion is that the transition probably raises more questions uh, and, and potentially even more, more problems that it, no, more questions. Uh, that it answers. But it was a very rich, dense, in-depth discussion. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Bye.